Welcome to Noir, an overview. What exactly is Noir? We say that Noir is, uh, is very difficult to pinpoint as a genre. And this is the important thing, is that people say, oh, it's a Noir film. This is film Noir, this is literature, uh, Noir literature. But Noir is very difficult to pinpoint as a genre of, of sorts. It is difficult because it's not truly a genre because um, it's been said that if you try to if you if there was a library that contained every single type of book noir would exist somewhere between uh, urban fantasy sci-fi horror and like Cthulhu Sherlock Holmes and and uh, romance novels <laughs> It would fall kind of like in the middle of all that. It doesn't really stand alone as a genre per se. It's more like a feeling or it's created through like the mood of the story. You can kind of describe it as like I've said here, a lingering sensation, like a, a cloudy day that looks like it's going to rain. It might be like a bad smell slowly creeping up on you. But noir is kind of like this feeling that's always in the background always stirring it's kind of unpredictable and you don't really know how in noir film like in the in noir film they use a lot of film techniques to create these noir feelings like the way they bend light uh, playing around with lighting effects are very it's very very important in noir because that creates mood creates tone um, tension uh, one very famous way that light is used in noir is the people looking through Venetian blinds. Those are the blinds that have a built like the curtain that's uh, panels of plastic or wood, and the light kind of comes through them in rectangles. Someone looking through those, you know, the lines kind of come on their face like a zebra pattern, or a single street lamp on a dark street. Because uh, noir, it kind of has a little bit of light but it's just the rest is all darkness. I've got some more notes here. I say that usually noir takes place in a urban environment, although it can take place in rural or countryside, or even in even in other settings like psych, uh, space stations. Um, but a lot of the original noir, the noir kind of began in the 1950s. Oh, I was gonna get into a bunch of, I was gonna get into a bunch of history about it but just know that noir kind of has this urban feel to it especially in the 1950s because you can't really talk about noir without talking about film noir because that's really how the genre was presented to most people in cinemas um, another thing is that most of the stories in noir they don't really like the outcome of the story you know, it had this big storyline that will follow in the story or the film, but at the end of it, there's not really a solid solution to the problem, and there's not really a, uh, there's not a, um, there's not a solution to the problem, there's no big consequence at the end. It's kind of like life just continues to go on as normal, because the city is so big, and there's people in it all over the place, so... All of these kind of all of these events don't really have a major significant impact on anything. Uh, the next thing to know is that yes, some of the some of the more famous types of protagonists include like detectives or business people, or even a murderer on the run. Okay, I've just included a fun little image. These are like action figures from just various like typical noir characters you can see. Um, you've got like soldiers, um, you've got the woman usually known as a femme fatale, a femme fatale usually means like the woman who is usually very uh, sly and very intelligent and she can kind of uh, uses her intelligence to get what she wants and usually uses her good looks to get what she wants. If you haven't noticed already, um, traditional noir is very much, it's extremely masculine and it's usually like male dominated. The aunt, like, there weren't, like, when Noir started in the 1950s, there weren't many female roles to it. And if there were, females were kind of limited to uh, a few archetypes, and I'll get into that next. But 
You have other characters like the mob boss, uh, his gangs, his gangsters. You have uh, maybe even a reporter or a writer. There's always usually a, a boxer or a drunkard. Uh, these kind of like city dwelling characters, usually not very nice people. But <laughs> uh, a bit of backstory, Noir began in France. Um, and that's the reason that it's called Noir. Noir means black. Is a French word, it means black. Uh, and that kind of comes across with the lighting like I talked about, but it also comes across that this idea of darkness, night time, is constant. That's why a lot of Noir takes place in, in the night time or in the rain. <laughs> Um, noir kind of picked up in America. The first kind of the first American film that was truly noir came out in the 19, 1939. Uh, and it would have there would have been more like noir films would have picked up earlier, but because uh, sorry because there was the Great Depression and in the Great Depression in the early 1930s and the late 1920s, people kind of needed some more light-hearted. People needed more light-hearted entertainment. Uh, there was a great, excellent novel I read called *The Grapes of Wrath* by Max Steiner, and this is a book about the about a family from o Oklahoma, I think. Oklahoma, family from Oklahoma traveling to California during the Great Depression, and there was a lot of mention of cowboy films because of how cowboy films make people feel. They made people feel hopeful, made people feel um, happier. They're very light-hearted, you know, you have the hero, and he does good things, you know, he's a good person. But then, um, after the Great Depression, people kind of wanted these more darker films. So in 1939, Noir started to come out in American cinemas. But it was halted, just by a, it was halted because of one small reason. Uh, it wasn't a small reason at all, it was World War II. Uh, the war came, Americans were busy fighting. They joined in the war. Uh, a bit later than Europe. Um, it was in the 19, 1940 when America started to get involved in the war against Japan and Germany and Italy. Uh, and in this stage, there wasn't a lot of de there wasn't a lot of time to go see cinema or to make films. So Noir was on, was put on the back pedal for uh, during World War II, uh, but it would come back after World War II uh, to fill the 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 dark minds of American people at the time, who were very, who kind of uh, you know this post-war fatigue. I think that noir suited that kind of feeling that they had. Um, the most common archetype for noir is usually because noir usually has a mystery attached. Who killed this person um, is usually the the most common storyline. Uh, a lot of noir stories will be about murder or there'll be some mystery the secret behind uh the ceo's wife or something like that or how he gets his money or something like that um how is this how are the detectives of noir uh different because we already have to we already have detective noir we have sherlock holmes we have uh, by conan doyle we have hercule Poirot by agatha christie the belgian detective um now these are, of course, the very like first sort of detective detective fiction. If you don't, if you, uh, but you, of course, if you don't talk about Edgar Allan Poe, who did some, you know, maybe some, maybe he was the first detective uh, writer, detective story writer. But Agatha Christie and Conan Doyle wrote, you know, of these really eccentric uh, gentlemen who were usually very intelligent very uh, witty and used the power of deduction and science to get to solve crimes um, but the detectives of noir they're a whole different bag of beans right they're not like that at all you know if you <laughs> of course if you ignore Sherlock Holmes cocaine cocaine addiction and his meth addiction was it meth or was it heroin no it was heroin if you ignore his heroin addiction right um, noir detectives are basically that heroin, cocaine addicted side of Sherlock Holmes, um, but that's that's the character. So noir noir detectives are usually substance abusers. They're usually troubled by their own minds. Um, like usually the you know stories have the antagonists. They have the villain, but in noir, 
the the protagonist is usually their own antagonist. Because they'll, they'll be the, they'll, they'll be a detective, but they're usually very troubled by something maybe that happened in the past, like a traumatic experience, or their drinking addiction, smoking addiction, or you know, above all else. Uh, the detectives often, the characters, you know, and the detectives often uh, they they go after lust or romance as well. And these are just their things that they deal with. They're usually very self-destructive. Uh, you can see here I've got three of the main kind of character archetypes in noir stories. If you read any noir, if you see any noir films, these are the these are the kind of characters you can expect to find. Um, the first one that we've gone over briefly is the, the detective, of course. Uh, detectives are usually um, self-destructive characters. Um, they kind of they use they're usually violent, um, unlike Sherlock Holmes or. Um, Agatha Christie's Poirot. Um, sure, uh, the noir detectives are not afraid of making a woman cry to get information, or punching a scared, um, scared, scared. Um, what's the word? Um, bystander in the face to get the information he wants. You know, he's he's not patient. He usually thinks with his fists before he th thinks with his mind. Um, and he's obsessive. He he obsesses over over things. Um, there's a f what was the story? The story I saw the other day. It was um, it, I watched a noir film. It was it was a murder mystery. There was a woman who died, and they had the detective. And he was finally going on holidays. You know, he's taking a vacation. And the, and as soon as he checks into his bedroom, he gets a newspaper that um, an actress has been killed. And he can't. And he, he can't rest. He has to go back to work. Um, they're usually obsessed with the case, or obsessed with maybe obsessed with money, obsessed with drugs, obsessed with women. But this usually will impact who they are as a character. Usually, it's a negative trait because they're so obs they're obsessed to the point of self-destruction. Um, then they're also nihilistic and reflective. Um, I said that because a lot of noir stories are usually told from the point of the character looking back on an event or looking back on their lives. Um, they usually have a very nihilistic outward outlook towards these events um, that happened in the past. You know, they're always, they, they don't see things in a positive light. They see things for what they are, essentially. Then there's the gang and boss. Um, they're usually like the big powerful gangs. They usually kind of terrorize the city and they are most more often than not they're the enemy of the detective maybe they're the ones who started the mystery maybe they killed someone and the detective is investigating it so usually they're like the enemy of the detective they look down at the city because they're powerful usually have a lot of money um, big gangs um, they're ruthless you know they, they kind of they kind of um, they don't they don't take a break they're always always um, causing trouble in the city uh, they're always um, greedy and arbitrary because of course with the mob boss it's all about making more money so the decisions they end up making is they usually get desperate um, so the decisions they make are usually questioned by the gang members they have and that can cause some interesting dynamics where the gang members maybe backstab their boss and kind of like switch sides almost or you know they lose faith in their boss and usually there's a whole breakdown of the game because of their arbitrary decisions. The final character archetype is the femme fatale. This is usually the standard female character for 1950s noir, 1940s noir too. Um, they're usually uh, alluring and desirable. Is uh, They can be betrayed in, the, in any one of those three ways. They're usually alluring or desirable, um, very attractive, very uh, intelligent, and uh, a lot of men just want to be with them. Um, and that they have the charm about them that uh, you know attracts a lot of men. Um, or they can be portrayed as a damsel in distress. You know they're terrified someone's out to get them, and they need the they need the detective to uh, protect them. Essentially, they come to the protect they come to the detective for protection. Um, so really playing on that stereotype of women being weak and defenseless. Uh, that's pretty much what noir does, especially in the in the early days. Uh, but then. 
it would often be usually used as a plot twist is that the the damsel in distress or the uh, attractive woman on the side uh, she would end up being the one behind the entire plot of the story. You know, she was the one who orchestrated the killings. Maybe she was uh, whispering in the ear of the mob boss and like, making, maybe, uh, uh, in, uh, influencing all of his decisions. And in the end, she she gets all of the power. She gets all the money, and uh, you know, everyone bows before her basically. Uh, I just put down some examples of early 20th uh, century noir films. You may have seen a few of these. Um, there's of course Pulp Fiction, there's Citizen Kane down there in the bottom left. Um, I, I watched Citizen Kane I think maybe three times, because it's just a fantastic movie. Uh, I've yet to see Chinatown, I've yet to see Double Indemnity, Gone Crazy and The Asphalt Jungle. Uh, the only other one I've seen there is Pulp Fiction, which is of course but, um, it's kind of a cult classic. Uh, th this is some more modern examples of noir films. Um, undoubtedly, you guys have seen these. Um, of course, Joker kind of counts as a noir film because it focuses on the life of one character who has a very tough kind of life. But he, and he, the, the actions he takes are not necessarily actions he wants to take. He doesn't become the Joker by choice. He becomes the Joker because of the, the scenarios that force him into it. And that's really what noir is. Similar with John Wick. You know, he doesn't want to go out and kill all these people. But they killed his dog, so he's going to do it. <laughs> um, another thing I should note is that, well, noir, in, noir is usually accredited to the 1950s, right? The 20th century. Um, we give this term neo noir, neo noir. I'll write that in chat for you guys. Neo noir, and that usually refers to the 21st century. It means new noir. Neo means new, and uh, where noir is very much black and white, neo noir plays along with plays around with color in a similar way to the way light was played in old noir films. Um, that's right, I mean neo noir. I can't write in chat. Um, and then there's um, this one, Queen of the South, I'm watching currently. That's very good. And The Outsider, which is an excellent one. It's got Jared Leto in it. It's about a, um, it's about an American who comes back from World War II, and he joins the Yakuza, the Japanese gang, and he, um, he becomes a member of this Japanese gang and he ends up doing things essentially because he needs to find his purpose. He needs to find his purpose and he ends up doing things for his new gang boss and at the same time he's have, he's sleeping with the sister of one of the gang members. And that's kind of like taboo. You know, it's taboo in Yakuza is that you don't have a relationship with the gang members, with your gang members female relations, uh, relations because yeah, Yakuza, they can't consider themselves to all be family. So, you don't you don't uh, you don't sleep with your brother's sister, essentially. <laughs> what is that? John Wick had a lot of light play. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that's what we kind of call um, neo-noir. Uh, is that that light play is seen a lot in the 1950s films, and but it's all usually done in black and white because there was no access to coloured film back then, of course. But in more modern noir films, we see the light is played in these fantastic ways. Like you might see like the signposts of buildings in the city, or um, neon, signs on, neon signs in the street, the way they bounce off the character's face. And I think probably the, one of the most famous scenes from a neo-noir film is Blade Runner 2046, 2046 I think. And that's the scene in the top left where the, um, of course, the iconic bridge scene where the woman is, the advertisement, the woman is speaking to him. And that is a, a fantastic example, again, of how light is played with in neo-noir. I also included Death Note in there because I know Death Note is, is very popular. Uh, a lot of you, a lot of people have, have enjoyed Death Note. But that is also noir because it follows the story of a character who suddenly gets all this power and it, it demonstrates how he handles it. Uh, he initially wants to use it for good, but then he turns to evil, which is again common in noir. Also, here's some games as well. 
Uh, I put games in here because I know people on Twitch love games, and I love games too. So here's some example of games. Heavy Rain, of course, is very noir style. It's about a detective trying to solve a case. I even included L.A. Noir in the bottom left. Uh, Wolf Among Us. I love I love Wolf Among Us's um, comic style. It was reminiscent of. I didn't actually watch Wolf Among Us or play it, but it was very reminiscent of the Walking Dead video game. Uh, Papers Please. I included Papers Please because I do think it falls into noir. You play as a border secure, uh, border security, border security who wants to feed his family. So you do this job that you don't want to do because you're arresting people. You know you're and you're like protecting the country, but it's not always easy, as you'll find out. Um, and of course, there's also um, Detroit Become Human. I would consider that noir or neo noir because it focuses on a detective, and not just a detective, other characters too. And it's usually got a lot of noir uh, themes in it, like uh, betrayal and hardship, uh, abuse of drugs, uh, substance abuse, and uh, mystery. It's got a mystery to it as well. Mystery is a huge part. And GTA. I play a lot of, I've played a lot of GTA before. I'm walking through the story now, off stream. And there was uh, uh, quite a few noir references in there, so I think it's very good. Like even Michael says, Michael says something about university. He says, "Go to university so you can get a degree, and then you can so you can study about how to rip people off." And I thought that line was that's the line when he meets Franklin. No, yes, yeah, it's, it's the line when Franklin comes to his house and they sit by the pool. He says that to Franklin. I think that line is just so noir. Um, I am a writer, as a writing channel, it's very important also to get into noir literature. And these are just four examples that I included from books that I have not, that I have either read or would like to read. The first one is Restoration Heights, which is one that I've, I've actually wanted to read, um, basically just on the cover, because <laughs> I like the New York setting. The next one is the New York Trilogy, because I love New York, right? <laughs> this is uh, a story by Paul Aster. Um, the way he writes is very uh, interesting because it focuses on a few different characters. It has three different. It's a book with three different stories inside it, and it really just warps you because uh, I won't spoil too much. But the book, it's like the book turns inside out, if you can think of it without spoiling too much. Um, but it's very good. I recommend it. It follows. As, it follows a character who. Is a detective, or he becomes the detective because of a phone call, and he is so dedicated to the case, he becomes obsessed with it, that he ends up sleeping in a alleyway for a month, and he becomes pretty much skin and bones because he hasn't eaten, he hasn't slept. But that's, and then he finds out that uh, he finds out that the case was solved over a month ago, and he's been hiding a month for no reason. Uh, so that's just an example of how dedicated he can be to the case, you know? Um, the next one I would like to read is by an Australian author. This is Kerry Green Greenwood. Um, it's called The Lady with the Gun Who Asks the Questions. And I was interested to see a female t uh, female protagonist in noir because it's so male dominated. You don't get a lot of sh you don't get a lot of strong or a lot of stories with female cat protagonists and that's what interested me about that. And also just because I love the color green. It's my favorite color. And speaking of green, we got an, uh, an Irish one. It's actually not Irish, it's uh, American, but it's, it's got an Irish character named Hennessy. Uh, I read Hennessy. It's probably my first noir novel that I actually read. And it focuses on a former, can I say that? Can I say uh, Irish uh, Republican Army? Yes, the Irish Republican Army. Um, and he loses his mother, he loses his wife and his daughter to the British Army firing squad who were firing on a group of strike of uh, strikers, people striking, going on strike from work side. And his mother and his wife and his son get caught in the crossfire. And this causes Hennessy to go off on this journey to get revenge on the 
Kurdish soldiers, not by killing them personally, but by going and actually taking out the queen is his end goal. Uh, but that's a very interesting story. I liked it as well. I have some examples from it to go with. So if you have a pen and paper, or if you just want to listen, I'm, I'm going to read a few examples from, um, from the New York Trilogy and also Carrie Greenwood's uh, The Lady with the Gun Asked Questions. And just so we can unpack a few of the techniques. And uh, please give me one second. I'm going to get a glass of water because uh, my throat is parched. Mientras todo dinamita, los sueños se derriten por aquí. Es así, veo la vida como Dalí. Yo soy quien soy, yo no pienso huir, aunque tenga que subirme al ring. Aunque busques el significado del amor en Google, dime que me quieres, pero no lo jures. Yo sigo como Goku, yo sigo en mi nube, regando las plantitas, empezando el lunes. Mi vida es una llama, yo no trazo un plan, lo que tenga que venir. Much later, when he was able to think about the things that happened, he was confident that there was a chance. But that was much later. In the beginning, the beginning of the event, he was confident. Ah, hey, the reason I chose this one uh, is because it's looking. Uh, it's about the. It's about the narrator or the character. We don't actually know who the narrator is yet. Guess we'll get to that later. But it looks, it looks back at the main character, and it refers to him, it refers to the main character, when he was writing, 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 I like, what I like most about this is that it says uh, that he would conclude that nothing was real except chance uh, because it kind of alludes to that noir style of just everything is uh, everything is out of your control and that um, nothing is everything is flawed and nothing is is uh, is cold is easy basically everything is put to chance. Um, that everything has consequences. Every event will have consequences. Uh, this was another one I actually included. So this is about. This is much later when Quinn. Quinn has become a detective and is following Peter Stillman. Peter Stillman is the antagonist, if you like, so far of the first novel. But that's that's as much as we know in the first novel. I will, again, I once more. After the car had dropped him off in front of his house, Quinn realized that he was hungry. He had not eaten since breakfast early that morning. It was strange, he thought, how quickly time had passed and the stillman apart. If his calculations were correct, he had been there for more than 14 hours. Within himself, however, it felt as if he had as no, if it felt as though he had his had his visit had lasted three or four hours at most. He shrugged at the discrepancy and said to himself, I must learn to look at my watch more often. Uh, now this one demonstrates again the, uh, as I said, the obsessive nature of the noir detective. Is that the detective becomes so engulfed in his case or the action that he's doing that he loses uh, track of time in this case. Uh, when he says that 14 hours become 3 or 4 hours, um, he is obsessing over the case and he's keeping him so busy that he cannot keep track of time. Um, and that's also why later on he will, he will become so obsessed that this, cold, this case will completely engulf him and he will become like a fraction of the man that he is when we first meet him. Um, this is from the opening line from the lady with the green gun asks questions. When I say the lady with the green gun, the lady with the gun asks us the questions. Okay, that's that's the name of the book. I made a mistake. So I, I have not read this book yet, but I included it here as an example of. Actually, this is an Australian author. Australian author. And I 
included this in here because the WAV is, is very much American dominated. It's got a lot of American cultural references in it because that's where it really grew up. It was America. It was created in France. Influenced by Germany. They were in America. But uh, that that doesn't mean that every noir piece has to be American. And this is actually a story about an Australian. Uh, but named Pierin named Pern Fisher. I'll try my best to read this. Is that how you spell that? Oh, how do you pronounce that name? Pierin? Pierin? Oh god, I should have researched that first. That's okay. Pierin Fisher, sitting in the lobby of her palace hotel, laid down the times and turned it at the sound of the plaintive flat Australian vowels. Born in Richmond to a cleaning lady and a drunken remittance man, christened Pierin the, co- the courtesan instead of Psyche the nymph. So poor that she had been challenged the big that she had challenged the big boys for old tomatoes from the from the peak bins of Victoria Market before being whisked to England and hon to her name and wealth. She had no reason to remember Australia with any favour, but the voice brought her back hot brought back hot sun, eucalyptus leaves, sour cream, made off real cream. She folded the, the, the paper and listened. Uh, this is the opening paragraph of the story, and what I liked about it is because it sets up the character, who she is, and setting up the character is important for any writer to know how to do, because you know, you're, you're introducing your characters to the audience for the first time, but it's important to know how to do that, and I think I like the way that they did this in noir, because in noir, a lot of the characters are very much working class, and that's no coincidence, um, a lot of the characters are working class, it's no coincidence that um, initially most of the people who enjoyed who enjoyed noir were working class people themselves, because the protagonists and the characters in the story were all working class, um, and like maybe ex soldiers. So this was very popular in the beginning of America in post post war time. Um, people kind of had kind of maybe a more nihilistic approach to looking at life after that. But what I like about this is that even this is an Australian novel um, about an Australian woman, and she she doesn't have fond memories of her family. You know, her dad was a remittance man, and her mother was also her mother was a cleaning lady. You know, these are these are um, working class jobs. You know, they're not very powerful jobs. Well, not it's not considered by like um, societal standards. And at the same time, her father was a drunkard. You know, substance abuse. So she hasn't pe- she hasn't had a very happy childhood. She remembers how she was um, fighting for food in the in the Victoria Market, which is a marketplace in Melbourne. That's very uh, is it is it yes yeah, very very uh, famous in Melbourne. I went there myself. Um, it's a huge marketplace. People sell food and goods to this day. But she doesn't have a happy memory of Australia, and she was even she ran away to England, was sent to England for new. So, I wanted to say, how can you write noir? So, you can think of noir as you could write it like you would any other story. Got my pen and paper here. Um, you can start with the protagonist. Who is your main character? Who is your protagonist? And and you have the the story is a, a plan. You, you fo- your character follows over your plan, like a plan to get wealthy or a plan to get powerful. Or there's a mystery that needs to be solved, or maybe it's a st- maybe it's a tale of revenge, like in Hennessy, where he goes off to kill the queen and then revenge for- to avenge his wife and daughter. Or it could just be drama, like a romantic. Maybe maybe they want maybe the character is trying to navigate a difficult relationship, or maybe they're trying to pursue a new relationship. And of course, at the end there is your resolution. Um, but of course, it's not that easy. Um, characters in noir have to have flaws. That is the best part because, like I said, the, the characters in noir and they're not nice people. They're the kind of people you don't want to meet. They're violent, abusive, uh, foul, usually very questionable people. But you want them to, to have flaws because that makes them likable. People relate to flaws. People like a flawed character because they can sympathize, they can have sympathy for that character, and then they want that character to win, like Joker. 
Joker was, um, you know, Joker started off as a very nice character. He was just, he was caring for his mother. Joey was a bit weird, but he was caring for his mother. And then he just went crazy and did a bunch of bad things. But people, st we still rooted for him because we cared about him. We were invested in the character. So you want your character to have <laughs> character might suffer from mental illness, and this might be the, as I said, the character's flaws are usually the antagonist of the story. So maybe they suffer mental illness. Maybe the character actually dies, or maybe a close loved one to them dies, and that will slow down the story. Or maybe they'll give in to their substance abuse. Um, there was a great example from The Postman Always Wings Twice. It's about, it's about a young man who just escaped jail, and he meets a married woman and her husband, and the story is about this married woman and him having an affair. Um, and they want to make enough money to leave leave her husband and make a new life in the city. So what happens is he gets money, he gets $300, and you know, this is it, we're like, we're like, oh great, now him and the wife can run away and start a new life. But then as soon as he gets $300, he thinks he can make more. So he tries to make a bed of pool, a pool, a schooner. And what happens is he ends up losing all of the $300 he made because of his own gambling addiction. Something as simple, something as good as like something like that. That is normal. Uh, next is, and these were just some techniques that I listed just to finish off. Uh, these are some things you can think about if you ever want to try and write noir, or if you ever have a go at writing noir. Do your characters speak in fast-paced sentence or sentences with witty dialogue, or is it more slower, long, or thought-out sentences? Uh, I know when I write my novel, a lot of the characters are speaking in very slowly, well-thought-out novels, or well-thought-out pieces of dialogue, and it's usually kind of slow read. Uh, is your narrative told from a first-person point of view, a third-person point of view, or is there a narrator separate from the characters who tells the story? Uh, is your story in past tense or present tense? A lot of noir stories, that I've read anyway, they're told in the past tense, because it's usually like the character reflecting about it. But it can be, I have seen it done in the present tense as well. It's, t it's possible. Like in um, New York Detective Trilogy by Paul Oster, that's that is the first story is completely told in the past tense, but it can be done in present. My my story, Gentleman Gun, so far is in present tense, or at least it was in present tense, but then it kind of shifted to past. Uh, it's important to think about the main character and the other kind of characters in your story. So, what kind of character is your main character? Are they are they one of these common uh, archetypes we talked about before? Or are they someone new, someone that you wouldn't expect to be in a noir story, perhaps a child, or maybe a doctor, who, someone you wouldn't necessarily expect or to see? Because it's always good to keep your readers surprised. Um, what kind of world do they live in? Is it urban? Is it a rural space? Or is just always set on a space station? Is it set on another planet? Is it in the jungle? Is it under the sea? You can pretty, you can get very creative with it. Um, and who is the who dominates this world? What kind of forces are at play? Is there a mob boss that controls this underwater dome that you've created for the characters to live in? Or maybe there's an asteroid coming to hit the Earth and maybe the characters try to stop it somehow? Like maybe they do that. Do that somehow? In my story, Gentleman Gun, I focus on. Um, Characters live in like a capitalist dystopia, and the main forces are played for corporations. Four corporations uh, pretty much decide everything that happens in this capitalist dystopia that their characters live in. Uh, what are the complications for the characters? Um, so, what are your characters' flaws? Because this like defining trait of noir is flaws. Everyone has flaws, and usually noir brings out the worst in human nature. People act on their flaws because they don't know how to act. They don't know how to ignore their flaws anymore, and they use their flaws as strengths sometimes. Um, or do they use their flaws as strengths? Maybe you could decide if they use their flaws as strengths or. 
if they use the if their flaws completely inhibit their progress in the story. Maybe it slows them down, maybe it doesn't maybe they don't get what they want because of their flaws. And uh, the last point is um, what motivates the characters to do what they do. And this is important for any story. You have to always have a character motivation. Or maybe there's something that slows them down from finding out what the mystery is or getting what they want. Maybe in a story, maybe maybe he wants this relationship with a married woman, but he doesn't. But he stops himself because her husband is a very powerful mob boss, <laughs> something like that. But these are some important things to think about when you write your noir. Um, that's my presentation. It's uh, that's it. But um, I hope that kind of cleared up a little bit what it means to write, what it means to write noir, what it, what noir actually stands for, what it symbolizes. Uh, I think it's very important to, to know because I am a noir channel. It's important for me to know what I'm talking about, for you guys to have at least some idea of what I'm what I'm trying to center my channel around. I want to make it more obvious with actual channel art what I'm trying to do. Like maybe include some channel art to show more noir themes. Um, but there'll be a lot of things to look forward to in the future. In the future, there's going to be a lot more things to to show off. So that's really exciting. I guess the note I wanted to finish on before I go offline today is that Noir has a lot of scope. Oh, it's like there's still a lot of potential. We haven't seen the end of it yet. I believe that, you know, we have Neo Noir, we have Noir from the 1950s. There's still so much out there we can do with it. And that's what I want to include in my, in my writing. I want to try and grow Noir. Yes, definitely the the class the class aspect is was huge um, because that was the people it most appealed to. I think because the characters were usually those kinds of people, and even uh, noir even began to make its way to France. It even got very popular in France. American noir came from France and was shipped back to France in a way that people wanted to enjoy. And people in France began to crave because it portrayed. Like, during the Great Depression, we have these cowboy movies, cowboy films, and maybe war films, that portray America as this heroic country uh, that can do no wrong, and there's always, it's like, like maybe like a land of opportunity, a dangerous, unexplored land of opportunity. But for the first time that it had ever been done, noir films presented this image of the USA as a very... A, a very different kind of USA, one that was more harsh, a real, a more harsh kind of feel to it than we than there had ever been seen, and people loved that. Um, people just ate that up so much because it was new, it was exciting. No one had ever presented this con their country, you know, for what it was. Some might say, you know, it's the life on the streets or behind the behind the Venetian blinds or under the, like the, the shotgun under the bar. Those kinds of things. And that's why Noir has a lot of like backstabbing and stuff in it, a lot of plot twists. Like a great plot twist is when the femme fatale completely re is revealed to be the orchestrator of the, the, the murder of us. But she she betrays, she falls up, she seduces the detective and then betrays him or something like that. That's usually a very good like <laughs> very good uh, plot twist. And that kind of that kind of stuff was really appealing to people. And yeah, it's definitely with class people. 